Fantastic. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Welcome to Choose FI. Tonight, we're going to talk about travel rewards on the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. A little context here. We uh, didn't, we, we been, we've been podcasting for about 40 years now, Brad. Do you know that? Do you know? Time just flies. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Days are years and uh, years are days. I would say uh, 2021, it was more like days are years. Uh, or sorry, 2020 days were years. They just, it just dragged out interminable. But having said that we, we made it to spring and I think we have a sense, both of us that travel is top of mind for me personally. I know because I did no travel last year, we canceled our plans to go visit family in Africa, in Zimbabwe, uh, that got canceled. So we have that in mind for a little bit later on this year. And I know that our community I'm seeing just in the, in the Facebook group. Uh, conversations around destinations and redemptions are are picking up traction, picking up steam. So with that in mind, it seems like it's time to dust off some travel we- travel rewards cobwebs and yeah. see does it or is this even a thing? Does this still work, or was that just something that was a thing that happened way back, you know, in 2017, and and the glory days <laughs> are gone. Yeah, back in the good old days, right? That's I, I guess we did our first major travel reward show way back in episode nine, which is crazy that it's 400 plus episodes ago uh, and four plus years. That's hard to believe. But yeah, it's 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 interesting. You're right. Like travel, it feels it feels like there's hope again. It feels like I don't know when precisely it's going to you know go back to quote unquote normal, but but it feels like it's on the horizon. And I know actually, I I mentioned this to you, I just traveled down to Orlando with my family, which is actually really, really cool. We uh, drove down there. It would be a lot cooler if I knew for a fact that you'd use travel rewards to get there. Uh. Oh yeah, it would be a lot cooler. (laughs) So I, I will tell you why I was down there. But yeah, so we stayed at an Airbnb and I realized because again, travel rewards really hadn't been top of mind, if it had been, I should have opened up a Capital One Venture card and used those venture points to offset my Airbnb. That's actually one of the kind of cool uses of venture points and miles or whatever you want to call them these days, is you can offset you can offset travel expenses with it. And Airbnb depending on is how it's one coded, of, right? So that's an important thing, how it shows exactly. up on the statement. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. I think like we were about to discuss the point eraser there. I think that's what they call it. Right. (laughs) But to get there, I think we actually should, I think the conversation, like you just highlighted, we did this four years ago, we're going straight to capital venture and how you can use it for Airbnbs. But I think there's probably a larger framework to engage in this conversation. And I'd love for us just to start with just building blocks. Like what, what are travel rewards just first and foremost? Yeah. So I guess, I guess really the starting point is a lot of us, responsibly use our credit cards. And while many of us get cash back and we've always been kind of happy with maybe 1%, one and a half percent, you know, if you're really lucky, maybe you have like a card, like the fidelity card and you get at least the last time I checked, it was 2%. It's probably actually a little lower than that now, but you know, that's about the best you can do. Alternatively, you can use credit card point credit cards that offer travel miles and points. And I think the upshot of that is that you can usually transcend that and get significant value, often two, three, four, or significantly more cents per point on each of those points if you you know what you're doing, essentially. So if you plan ahead, if you're flexible, if you can find really cool redemptions, I think there's a way, it's just like anything we do, Jonathan, there's a way to win at the game. Right. And I think that's what we in the Fi community try to do. We try to look at this game of life and figure out how can we win. Right. And I think getting more value out of your normal credit card spend is a way to win. And I think that is one of kind of the coolest, the coolest aspects. You know, we call this, we deem travel rewards a pillar of Fi way back in episode 21. Right. And, and I, I hold to that. I think being able to get one or two free trips a year, pretty close to free. You know, it's not exactly free, but it's pretty darn close. One to two free trips per year using your responsible credit card habits. That's pretty darn good. For most people, that feels like winning. Well, yeah. I, and I always like the idea of just upfront like, attaching just a, a, a framework for what this strategy is generally worth. So using the example you just gave, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, 
All right, what they normally offer us, like most cards come with like a, a 2% cash back, maybe a 2.5 for this example, just a 2% cash back. So if you were to spend $4,000, which is a pretty hefty sum of money, several months worth of expenses, you're going to get 80 bucks for that, for, for spending that $4,000, they're going to give you 80 bucks back. And we can talk about the why they would want to give you any money back shortly, but you know, roughly 80 bucks. Conversely, if we're saying now that if you follow a strategy that we're talking about, you, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get 2%. You would be able to get maybe as much as like 30% on your money. You're, you're basically saying that that $4,000 could generate for you an additional $1,200 to put towards a trip or a redemption of your choice. And that's just potentially with one card. And that's a pretty moderate redemption. If you stack a couple of these together, you could basically say, all right, I could build my, my normal expenses around this sort of strategy. And I could create basically a pretty fully funded travel budget without having to account for it. Um, in my, my normal budget, Brad, I'll give that back to you, but is that a relatively decent framework for why we're talking about this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that sets the stage for, for what kind of value you can be looking at certainly. And, and the why as to how that's even possible, right? I think a lot of people have the question of like, is this a gimmick? Is this real? Is how can it possibly be? And I think what you're talking about there, because, you know, on the face of it, that sounds crazy right? Like you're normally going to get 80 bucks in rewards, 2% in, re in rewards on your 4,000 of spend, or you might get 80,000 points that you can turn into $1,600 worth of travel, right? Or maybe more. Like how could that possibly be? And I think really the key is to know that there are on these premium travel rewards cards, there are these massive signup bonuses. And now when you use that, that, four thousand dollars that was very specific i suspect that that is is the minimum spending requirement it's known as on our most popular our favorite card which is the chase sapphire preferred okay so when you sign up for the chase sapphire preferred so we're recording this actually on march 30th 2021 the sapphire preferred the bonus just increased on that card to 80,000 Chase Ultimate Rewards points, okay? So this is an all-time high. It's an incredible, incredible offer. And if you, but the, the fine print is, you have to spend $4,000 in the first three months that you have that card open, okay? And there is a $95 annual fee on that. So the way that this works, that's not $4,000 that you are, of random expenses that you are, that you're throwing money away. This is your normal spending. I think that's the critical part is, you're putting, like, I know my family, we use credit cards for everything. So we easily spend that, you know, whatever, $1,300 a month on our credit card and we pay it off on time and in full every single month. And when we reach, let's say we did open that card, we reach that cumulative $4,000 in that first three months, that then triggers this bonus. And then all of a sudden, we have 80,000 of these ultra, ultra valuable ultimate rewards points. And so again, the, you know, you look at opportunity costs, right, Jonathan, it's, it, that's what it's always, we're, we're always comparing two things. That's, that's the concept here of opportunity costs. So I could have put that on a normal cash back card. And if I was really lucky, got, got 2%, so 80 bucks, or I get 80,000 ultimate rewards, which I think I can get two cents per point on very easily, which would be $1,600 of travel. Now, obviously, you have to net that against the $95 annual expense, which is a pittance compared to the $1,600. So you're still your $1,505 to the good. You know, this is we're using specific numbers here, but it's to paint a picture. And as compared to $80, right? So that nothing can illustrate better the power of these signup bonuses than that. And you're not just limited to one signup bonus. You know, that's that's the cool thing, right? Like I know my wife and I both open credit card. So we could both theoretically, as long as we could hit the minimum spend, we both could open a Chase Sapphire Preferred. We both could open the next card and the next card, right? So you can certainly start accumulating points. You see how that can turn into from 2% rewards to, like you said, 20, 30, 40% rewards pretty easily. And that's like getting a 20, 30 or 40% rebate on every dollar you spend in life. That's That sounds like winning to me, right? think so. And I think the way to think about this is what if you, when you're, 
coming up with your estimated, you know, cost of living your life, no longer had to account for that, your travel goals inside of that budget. Instead, what you did is, all right, here's what my life cost. And if I structure how I pay these expenses, is there a way for me to then also be able to create for myself a $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 a year travel budget without, and and, and I guess we should talk about this. It's also a tax-free travel budget just the weird nature of the way these points uh, do not show up on your, on your tax forms. Uh, I'll basically say you could have a tax-free travel budget. So I just, just that that's kind of, we're going to get into the very specifics and we're going to build our way up from here. And Brad gave you one example already, but the underlying idea is, all right, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if my life costs $40,000 a year, $50,000 a year, whatever that number is. But because of the way I structure my expenses, I know that I also have enough for two completely paid for trips a year, whether that be to Europe or domestic or whatever, I've got that completely covered. So I don't need to account for that anymore. That is what we're going to try and set up for ourselves. And it really allows us to have, you know, I guess what you would maybe say like an upper middle-class lifestyle, what you would expect, all the trappings that you would want on a, a, a much smaller amount than, than what you might first expect. Uh, I would call it stealth wealth, right? We're, 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 it's, it's truly a version of stealth wealth. All right, Brad, we got a framework here. We are taking questions. So we're looking for questions to bring your input in here. We know it's a deep topic. We're going to try to make it super simple and we're going to weave your questions in as they kind of fit the general content that we want to cover. There is a submit a, a voicemail button on the stereo app. There is a little trick to that as we've noticed after a couple of weeks in that when you let go of that button, your, your voicemail will truncate. It will chop off. It will, it will not, it will not include anything after the point at which you release that button. So if you have a full question, make sure you leave your, your finger on that button until you're good and done with that question. (laughs) Yeah. And Jonathan, something you said in there, I really wanted to touch on is, is this is setting a framework for why travel rewards should be an important part of your FI journey, right? There we could get in, we could and probably will get into some nitty gritty on this episode, depending on the, the questions we get. But that's almost beside the point for, for this particular episode. This is, why do you want to do this? What's the mental framework? Just like anything we do here, Jonathan, right? Like we talk about, we talk about FI and the nuts and bolts of money, right? Like once you get the nuts and bolts down, you can get into the deep dive of the Roth IRA conversion ladder and and this and that, right? And like, and do all the real in-depth stuff. But that's kind of like that long tail, like that top 10%, right? Like you can get the vast majority of the benefit of FI doing what I do, which is 10 minutes a month on my finances. Similar to this with travel rewards. If you understand the theory and you understand why this is important, you start planning ahead you're flexible, right? Like this is the mental framework you want to build when it comes to, when it comes to travel rewards generally is you want, like I said, you want to plan ahead. So you want to start thinking about this. You don't want to go to united.com and find the best flight to Tahiti you've ever found that on this unbelievable flight and not have the points, right? You want to have the points well in advance. You want to be flexible, which means You know, that's, that's kind of how we go about our lives in FI is we think long-term and we're flexible, right? So what does flexibility mean with travel rewards? It means, all right, I want to go to Europe next fall, as opposed to, I need to go only to Florence on July 6th through July 10th. You know, you might be able to make that work and you almost undoubtedly can save money, but it sure is not going to be as easy as hey, I would love to take a two-week trip to Europe next fall. If you have that kind of lead time, you have a year and a half lead time, and you want to do something even as grand as that, you can do that pretty easily. But it's a matter of just of having that little bit of flexibility because, frankly, there are frequent flyer seats and they fill up, right? Maybe not right now. Now it's probably ah. actually a pretty good time to, to book if you had the miles and the inclination to travel right now. But... In normal times, which they will come again soon, certainly, frequent flyer seats, they they fill up. That's just the reality of the world. This is not somebody out to get you. This is not blackout seats. This is just there are millions of people with points, and they book flights, and that happens. So if you're stuck on going to Florence on those specific days, 
you know, that might not work quite so easily. But again, if you are as flexible as I want to go to Hawaii next fall, or I want to go to Europe next fall, or whatever it may be, like, you can almost undoubtedly do that. And I think, you know, just having that concept of flexibility and flexibility fits in, in a lot of senses, right? It fits in with the type of points you have. And Jonathan, I don't mean to, uh, to steal all your thunder here, but like, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I do want to go. I, there's a couple ways I want to tackle this. So let me grab this from you just for a second and then give it right back to you. I promise. I, I wanted to kind of approach this from the direction, recognizing first and foremost, we're a personal finance show and we're talking about credit card usage. And, uh, what's funny about the conversation that we're actually having right now is it was one of the very first conversations that Brad and I had, uh, at a little, uh, burger joint here in Richmond, Virginia. And the reason that I was actually, one of the things that I was found so compelling about the financial independence community is that they are contrarian thinkers and they're questioners. And every single personal finance book I had ever read always had a chapter talking about how you should never have credit cards or how credit cards are the devil or how, you know, like it's just, it was a litany of reasons in which I all, I agreed with it. But at the same point, I recognized that my most fiscally responsible friends, the ones that were doing really the best were on a solid trajectory and this financial independence community were all using credit cards. And that pattern has held up over time. People with large net worths and great, you know, they are not worried about using a credit card. Whereas coming from something like maybe a Dave Ramsey camp, which was an introduction to personal finance for me, there's a huge fear of credit cards. And I just didn't feel that way personally. And I thought that there was a, a room here. And so kind of bringing all of that potential baggage in with me and then getting a chance to talk to Brad, one of the first places to start is really like, you know, Brad, is this, is this too good to be true? Which we just talked about. But then, like, who is this good for? Like, th does this ever go wrong? Like, what's the downside of this? And so, Brad, in terms of our question, someone's listening to this, they're coming thinking, like, no, I heard credit cards, so I'm about to switch the episode. Like, I, that's it. Like, who is this for? Who is this not for? And why is it okay for us, but maybe not for someone else, you know? Yeah, I think it comes all down to something I kind of alluded to before, which is we are responsible with our credit cards. And... This is certainly, uh, obviously we know many, many millions of people get in trouble with credit cards and they carry, carry a balance and they pay significant interest. This is not for that person, right? There, that's a five alarm fire. You've got to pay off your credit card debt. Do not even think about travel rewards that, you know, maybe down the road at some point, but figure that out, right? That, that truly is a, your hair is on fire type financial situation. If you are someone who uses your credit card and pays it off on time and in full every single month, no matter what, okay, then, then you start thinking about this, right? And you obviously, you have to, you have to know yourself. I think that that is what all of personal finance and FI comes down to is you have to know yourself, like what, what makes sense for you. And, you know, Jonathan, we talk about this with ultra optimizers, you know, we have, uh, you know, you're certainly more of an optimizer than I am. Ed on our team, who's uh, sitting in the background here moderating questions, is 10x me and probably 2x you, right? Like, yeah, you know, some something like that. Something. You and, know, we have, we have our own areas, and I would say in travel right. rewards, you'd be hard to find someone that's more optimized than Ed. But, but, but point is taken. Like, there, there's room for everybody to participate in this. You know, you Without can tip your toes in and get a win. Or you can take a six month trip that would cost, you know, cash value over a hundred thousand dollars, all completely covered by travel rewards all around Asia, touching, you know, I don't know, 10 plus countries on that period of time. Like Ed did with his entire family traveling first class and our business class and the hotels and the whole nine yards. Or you could just get your two free trips a year and, 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 you know, your one trip to Disney world and your, you know, things like that. Like you can do this the easy way. Just, Oh, I don't need to cover travel anymore. Or you could say, okay, this is a game. How can I squeeze every drop out of the strategy? And then, you know, Ed got you covered there too. And can kind of show you a little bit of that, but you know, Brad, to your point that you made earlier, as we kind of start to flesh this out and start bringing in questions. Uh, the key to this whole thing is to kind of understand the framework for this and then really to start planning early. The destination is like, if you don't, you don't necessarily start your travel rewards journey with like the exact date and trip in mind. You might for some people, but generally it's going to be helpful to already have the points 
aggregate it up and then give yourself that lead time to work for. So a little bit of nuance there. I kind of crossed a couple things, but generally you want to get points. You want to get points that are flexible. And then you want to, as you start to get a sense for where your trip's going to be, you want to narrow in on what you need to add to supplement that. Um, and so Brad, I guess if we were going to talk about, um, I'm trying to think how nitty gritty we should go here. If we should be talking about your why of travel at this point, or if we should be talking more about like airport airports or flexible points, I think it's going to be flexible points. What does it mean? I just talked about flexibility. What, what does flexibility actually mean in the travel reward space? Yeah, I think there's, there are a couple different ways to tackle that, but I, I think the most, the most obvious would be the, the transferable points currencies, if you will. So, uh, a bunch of the different major bank issuers have their own point currencies. So Amex has the membership rewards. Citibank has thank you. Actually, Capital One Venture Miles are now transferable. And then there's the Chase Ultimate Rewards points that we talk about constantly here. So those are really the four main transferable currencies. And now just to give you an example, I'll talk about Chase Ultimate Rewards since those that's the one I'm, I'm most comfortable with personally. But essentially how these points work is they exist in your credit card account. So let's say you open up that Chase Sapphire preferred card and you have, you get your 80,000 bonus points. You have 4,000 points from spending. So you've got 84,000 points sitting in your credit card account. Okay. They have, I think at last check, it was 13 airline and hotel transfer partners. So the way that that works is you can send those points from your chase account in any denomination and really in, in, uh, increments of a thousand points to any of those airline and hotel partners. So for instance, if you wanted to book a flight on United and you wanted to go, I don't know, to Europe, let's say that traditionally cost 60,000 miles round trip. So the cool thing is, because again, those points, they sit in your chase account. You would actually go to united.com. You would find that availability and then you would know, all right, this is here. You don't have to speculatively transfer the points because once you send them out of chase, you can't send them back. It's a one, it's a one way street. So you send it and it actually, they actually become United miles at that point or Southwest miles or Hyatt hotel points, et cetera. There again, there's roughly 12 or 13 of those transfer partners just for chase. So just built in, you have that flexibility, right? Because it touches on all the different airline alliances. That's another bit of flexibility, right? There's the three major airline alliances. So if you have United right there, which gives you uh, the star alliance, you have British Airways is the transfer partner of Chase, which gives you one world. And I think, I think it's still Korean air. I'm really, uh, I, I should have this memorized is uh, Sky Team. Uh, Ed will probably put in the in in our notes here specifically what it is. But uh, last check, it was Korean Air. So that actually gives you flexibility to book on any of those airline alliance partners. So again, it's it's flexibility upon flexibility. And I know that sounds confusing when you hear that, but it's not confusing at all. Like that's the beautiful thing is you just go to United.com and you search for a flight. And if it's on one of their alliance partners, it most likely is going to show up on just their simple search engine. You know, there's, there's, a, again, there's always more complexity if you want, but for people like me, for regular people who just want to book a flight, like this is the 80, 20 analysis. This might even be the 95, five analysis of this is, you know, you get the access to every star Alliance member just by having United miles. So really just by having chase ultimate rewards, because at a moment's notice, you can send them from chase to United. At a moment's notice, you could send them from Chase to Southwest and they become Southwest Miles, right? At that point, they're no longer related to your credit card account. They are just regular Southwest Miles or regular United Miles. And you can get all the benefits of having those miles with really significant reward redemption options, which is super cool. And yeah, it's a practical example here for me for this Africa trip that I've you know historically put together and am due for. So, uh, based on exactly what you said, you know, my wife and I would have our chase Sapphire preferred and we'd have our sign up bonuses attached to that. I would have maybe additional spend or additional chase cards that I've accumulated over time, the bonuses from those. And then, um, you know, it, any, adi- once the bonus has been earned, maybe you're continuing to use the card and you're earning points and all of that. And then when we make our trip to Africa, 
to Zimbabwe, I would do exactly that. I know I have my chase points. I know that it's likely going to go through United. Well, you're like, well, United doesn't go to, but yeah, you're right. United does not go to Africa, but United is part of Star Alliance. Star Alliance includes South African Airways and Ethiopian Airlines. Uh, and so then I would just take a look at uh, what my options were, and then I would just transfer those over. And it really, it, it, these ultimate rewards points and these transfer partners, they unlock, they unlock the world. They, they really do. So uh, knowing, I think that was a big, the scary, if I'm thinking back, that was the scary part for me was like, all right, I know that United doesn't go to Africa. Right, right. So that, you know, that's not going to really help me, but you need to understand this alliance bit that Brad just kind of mentioned here. This is the key to the entire thing. Knowing how these transfer partners, the alliance that they're in, allows you to put together these, what might sound like pseudo complicated routes, uh, makes it a lot easier. Yeah, let's see. I think we got some questions coming in. All right. You work with that to round the first question up. I'll build, and while you're doing that, I want to actually take about, I'm going to take a frequently asked question because this was one of the ones that I asked Brad thinking about engaging the strategy. I want to take the money, you know, cause I was budgeting about $2,000 a person for these trips to go to, to Africa. Uh, and so, you know, it's $4,000 every other year that I was kind of roughly carving out to do this. And when I went to Brad to get started, we we're having this conversation. I, I remember I had a couple questions. One, the how, like how does the alliance work? Would it work? Which I just kind of answered for you. And your question might be a version of that answer. Uh, but then two, my question right behind that was like, really, this feels like this is going to hurt my credit. Like this is like, I, I've, you know, I'm, I've had my one credit card. I've had it forever. Uh, will this tank my credit? So that is actually where I want to spend a couple minutes and I'm going to get the ball rolling. Brad, just kick in. Let me know when you're ready to come in here and you can either help me out with this question or we can go straight to answering it, but I'll, I'll kind of create a framework for this. I can tell you that it did not hurt my credit. I opened up probably four to six cards over a period of about a year. My wife did something similar and my credit maybe went down in the short term by about I don't know, five to 10 points, very, very marginal amounts. We're talking maybe from like 802 to like 780, 790. And then it went actually back above where it had been prior on the other end, which did not make any sense to me because I had just opened up, you know, several credit cards. But it, it's really important to actually understand how your credit rating uh, comes together. And there's five factors, most of which I'll be able to recall on the fly and Brad will be able to fill in anything I missed. Uh, but it is the reason that uh, it, it, it is the reason that it actually makes sense that when you approach this strategy, uh, your credit likely will either stay the same, go down just a tiny bit, or might even surprise you and go up. So let, let's hop into this. The first one that I want to talk about is, uh, is the negative factor. And that is the, the hard pull. When you put in your social security number to, uh, check your credit rating, that is a hard pull. And that dings you one or two points. It's pretty temporary. The one that comes after that though, it, that I'll talk about that actually works for your favor, obviously is that you make your payments on time and then, you know, make your payments on time, whether it's your minimum payment or you make the payment on time and in full, that actually works to your benefit. Another one, the third one that I'll mention, and then Brad, there's gonna be two more that I was gonna, I'm gonna have to quickly reference, but you'll probably know it off the fly. The third one that actually works massively to your favor is your utilization rate. This is the one that comes to mind that like you really need to account for this. When you have several credit cards, again, we're not using these credit cards to like uh, finance our life, right? Just be able to make it from one payment to the next. We're using these as part of a comprehensive strategy. We're making these payments on time and in full each month. Why is that? Why do we keep saying on time and in full? It's because when you swipe something on your card, you actually get somewhere from 30 to, you hear about all these bad interest rates, but you actually get 30 to 45 days interest free, you know, till the end of your next statement to make this payment. And then those interest rates that they show you on the label, that's when they kick in. So if you're paying the minimum payments, well, yeah, now you are paying you know, 12%, 18%, 25%, 27%, you know, whatever that card actually had. But if you're making your payments on time and in full, you literally, you have a zero. It's a 0% interest rate. They're, they're loaning you the money for free uh, for that for that 30 days. And as long as you pay it on time and in full, they, they collect nothing from you other than that annual fee each year. Then now it's important to actually look at what is happening in the process if you end up having several cards that, again, are being paid off on time and in full and likely a couple are kind of sitting dormant. You might be using them occasionally, but what I mean by that is they're not really being utilized. You don't, they're not full up with debt that you're financing. Debt utilization takes a look at 
how much capacity you have on the total of your card. So you, let's say you have three cards at $5,000 limit each. You have a, a, a total amount, a total borrowing capacity of $15,000. If at any given time, you only have one to $2,000 that you're swiping and paying off, you know, on time and in full, then your utilization is great. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. It's well above 70%. And so your debt utilization, which is one of these key factors in determining your credit score, uh, would actually be a positive indicator. And over time, as you have more of these cards, it would work for you. I could add one more that I have, and Brad, I'll leave the last one for you because I'm forgetting it, but it's the age of your credit. This is basically, you know, it, and this is actually a very interesting point. If you have one very, very old card that maybe back in the day, you know, you, you took some time to pay off or whatever, you don't necessarily, and it doesn't cost you anything, it do, you don't necessarily want to close that because the age of your credit, you know, the, the age of your accounts actually uh, is kind of an important piece of building up your total score. So there's a little bit of nuance in that one that we can work through as well. But Brad, I nailed four of them. What's the fifth one that I left hanging? I know there's one more. Yeah, I think you... Might have gotten most of them. Yeah, payment history, new credit, amounts owed, length of credit history. Oh, types of credit use. So that, that's just kind of an, an obscure one. So uh, yeah, the different types of credit you have. So that's one interesting thing is, yeah, if you've only ever had one type of credit, that's actually somewhat of a negative thing on your credit score, but it's, you know, not something to worry about in my experience. I, I don't obviously go <laughs> advocate getting a, uh, a car loan just so you have uh, a couple extra points on your credit score. So you can say that you have multiple types of credit. So, you know, obviously you have to take some of this with a grain of salt. I think once you get into the range where your credit score is 770, 790, 800, you know, and above certainly it's all kind of gravy at that point. It's really at what am I in the high, that highest echelon and will I get approved for, you know, when we're talking travel rewards, will I get approved for these real premium cards? And when you're talking other things like getting a mortgage, am I in that highest bracket? Am I going to get the lowest rate, right? Am I the, the lowest risk? You see that with lots of different aspects of your financial life. So uh, it's, you know, this is something that you want to keep as an important part of your financial life. But I have seen people freak out about, oh, my score went from an 823 to an 819. And they're actually worried about that, which uh, seems like a needless waste of worry and mental energy to me. So I think uh, you got to you got to keep this all in perspective, I would say. So. All right, Jonathan, I, uh, let's jump into a couple of questions. Uh, we're going to start with uh, one from Susie here. Hi, guys. This is Susie Spadafora from Richmond, Virginia. I just wanted to ask you what your favorite websites or tools are for trying to do your travel hacking and using your points and miles wisely. My favorite are Google Flights, Autoslash.com, and JuicyMiles.com. I'm interested to hear what your favorite ones are. So I've met Susie and she is dynamite at travel rewards. Uh, she doesn't play around with travel rewards. So Susie, uh, let's see, Brad. I'm, I'm curious to hear this answer <laughs> as well. Yeah, Susie, Susie told me she was going to send in a question before and I'm like uh, a little bit nervous about, <laughs> about it because yeah, Susie is a, is a true expert in this. So yeah, I just wanted to touch on, on one that she mentioned auto slash. That's a really incredible option for potentially saving on rental cars. So that actually would have been on on my short list for sure. Let's see. So I guess, you know, starting at the beginning, I definitely want to keep track of my my rewards points if I can. So I think what I used to do was in very uh, me fashion was do like a ultra low tech Excel spreadsheet. And that, as you can imagine, is uh, not the smartest idea because, you know, <laughs> there are expiration dates that you need to keep track of and et cetera, et cetera. And, and even the best laid system can uh, can get screwed up if it's not automated. So it seems like there are a couple of good options. There's uh, awardwallet.com that has a, a free option to basically plug in your, your uh, different rewards accounts and it keeps track of everything. Uh, so that is very cool. I, there's actually a, uh, a tool and in, in fairness, I have not used this, but I know a bunch of people in our travel rewards group have, and they recommend it. It's actually somebody, a guy named Zach, who's in our Fi community started a site called travelfreely.net. 
And I think it's a way to keep track of your, your credit cards. So again, I have not used that personally, but I have heard it recommended to me multiple times. So that's, that's something to consider. Uh, so I think, you know, things like that get you a sense of, of keeping track of your miles and then your cards. I think that's really important. Again, going back to like, who is this good for, right? It's you need to be organized. I think that that's critical. One thing that I use pretty often, that's just kind of like a, a random little thing, but it's, uh, it's seatguru.com. Jonathan, have you, ever, have you ever heard of this? I think you, I think I did use it. I used it one year and it like has to do with just making sure like you kind of know about the plane ahead of time. Like it's, it's, the, I'm, trying to remember, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I used that for one of my Zen flights. Yeah, no, you got it. You got it. It's uh, it's neat because you can, you can find out what the good seats on the plane are. So what's, what's cool when you, whenever you book a flight, whether it's, you know, with regular cash or whatever, or with miles, you can see the type of airplane that is being flown. So you just really simply like, let's say you're using, I don't know, Delta miles, you would type in Delta and I'm just making this up. I'm not an aviation geek, but Delta 737 dash two, you know, again, I don't know if that exists or not. I'm just making that up, but you would Google that. Right. And, or just put it into seatguru.com. I would Google it probably. And it'll seat guru will show up and then it'll show the exact configuration that Delta has for that plane. And it has then most of the seats will be, they'll be color coded. So it'll be like the last time I checked, it was like green, yellow, and red, you know? So it's really, really obvious that, Hey, you do not want to sit in row 16 F because that's right <laughs> near the lavatory or something, you know, like you find that out real quick or, Hey, this seat is still in regular economy, but you get a little extra leg room because of that. Right. So it's just a neat little tool to use to, uh, to just kind of win, right? Like who doesn't want a better seat if they can get it? Ah, seekguru.com making flights more enjoyable since 2019. Uh, <laughs> you know, Ed has this monster list that he actually aggregated and Brad, I'll, I'll, we'll find out which one of these you're actually using, but let me mention a couple of them because, and I think Susie would even be impressed by the ones that, uh, Ed has aggregated and used for this said six month flight around the world. One of them is the ITA software by Google. Now, Google Flights was actually maybe mentioned earlier. It's a great, it's a great way. Yeah, Susie actually mentioned Google Flights. It's a great way to figure out, you know, which airlines connect the two destinations together and there might be stops. But there's one that dials that up even farther and it is called the ITA software by Google. So if you're listening to the show notes, there'll be a link to that, to that link as well. But this one, the way it ups the ante even further, Susie, it includes a detailed breakdown of the fees and displays the timing of every single flight in your chart. So uh, Ed uses this instead of Google flights to find out, you know, which airlines are going to meet the needs, which routing has the lowest ancillary fees. You know, a lot of these routes, especially when they're more complicated, might have additional fees that are tacked on. If you could know that ahead of time, plan for it. It allows you to, gives you the ability to maybe make some judgment calls before it's too late on which flight is really the best for you. And then what Ed does is he actually searches for the award availability using expertflyer.com or the airlines website. And this is a great point. If you're talking about the airlines, you're going to want to become familiar with the airline mobile apps. They're going to make your life a lot easier. So if you have two or three hops and you're, and you're switching between some of these ports, you know, having your Delta mobile app downloaded, is going to make your life easier. Having your United uh, mobile app is going to make your life easier. And so just kind of being aware of which airlines have, uh, mobile apps is probably a good place to start. Brad, now I mentioned expert flyer on the go. Do you do want to maybe mention a little bit more about what that is and why someone might uh, be interested in that? Yeah. Yeah. I, so expert flyer, this, as I, I use this a couple of years ago, it's been a while and I'm just reading Ed's description here. If you ever want to go deep down the rabbit hole of travel rewards, the gold standard for finding award and upgrade availability is a paid subscription to expertflyer.com. So there are free options through Expert Flyer, but really the, the best way to utilize it is to use the paid subscription. And I, I remember it being very, very inexpensive. So this is not like a, a break the bank type subscription, certainly, but you were able to put in uh, particular routes and set up these alerts. So if you were looking for like one particular flight, and, you know, you wanted to know the second that, that availability came up, 
you could get it. And, you know, it, it just, it makes searching for the, so in fairness, the interface is pretty clunky or, you know, again, it was the last time I used it. So, uh, it's not the most user-friendly, but just like anything, you can find tutorials. And if you are really, really diving into the actual redemptions, and I think for a lot of people, Jonathan, you know, again, this goes back to the, the 80, 20 analysis of, of travel rewards is I think most of us, who don't want to make this a full-time, you know, hobby or, you know, a lot of people are just ultra ultimate optimizers and they love this, right? That's the ed and you're going to have a ball at expert flyer. You're going to have an absolute blast. You know, for me, I'm not quite that, you know, that optimized. So like I didn't use it quite that much, but again, if you are going to travel a bunch, probably three plus redemptions a year, you might want to consider that because it, it really does give you like an automated way to search. It's, uh, it really is pretty neat. And let me add on to that. You know, the, the, the individuals in our community that have really kind of built a lifestyle around this are often try to find others to do it with them. It's more fun to travel with company. And so her point in case, Marla, uh, in our, in our community is really known for taking the time to learn how to use these tools and putting together these awesome destinations and these awesome redemptions, and then coaching a small group of friends to get, go on the similar process, get the cards when she recommends it, build up this point stash and then process their redemption at the same timeline. And they, they take these trips together and that has led them to destinations all over the world. And so if you ended up being the person that's taking on that role of the planner, cause you enjoy it. Uh, the final tool that I'll mention here and Brad, then I'll get back to you for a final tool as well, but this is coming from Ed's like super high level stash here is the great circle mapper. Oh, and, uh, I use this all the time. <laughs> oh, nice. So this is a visualizer, right? So when you're, when you're visualizing your flights, when you're putting your trips together and Brad, I'm going to actually allow you to explain the nuance of the distance award feature. Cause that's totally different here. But when you're planning your trips, it is actually really helpful to have a general sense of the distance between one route to another. And because some of the charts have a distance based award chart. And whenever that is the case, the great circle mapper is your, is your best friend. So Brad distance based award versus maybe a standard redemption through a transfer partner. Give us a little, I guess they would all be transfer partners, but give us a sense for what the difference is and why someone would want to be aware of this distinction with how they approach the travel redemption plan. Yeah, we, we kind of look at what we call sweet spot redemptions and they are kind of, I guess, let's say inefficiencies or particular ways you can exploit different airline alliance partners and like their particular award charts. So, you know, I guess that phrase award chart has kind of gone away to a large degree over the last handful of years, but, but the concept still holds. So on a, a traditional legacy carrier, like let's say American airlines, this is it, again, we're, this is, it's too in the weeds to go into every last little detail of this, Jonathan, but, but we'll give the, the overview of this. So American airlines, let's say, yeah, they fly from Richmond to Miami. Okay. So if you used American airlines miles, at least at last check, just a round trip in the U S of a normal distance is 25,000 miles round trip. Now, sometimes, and maybe in this time they're running some specials, et cetera. We're just talking generalities here, right? In general terms, it's 25,000 miles round trip for, for a round trip in the U S all right. So that's using American airlines miles on an American airlines flight. But now again, we look for sweet spots. So we know, and again, this goes back to the alliances, right? So American airlines and British airways are alliance partners in the one world alliance. All right. And the cool thing is British airways is a transfer partner of at least two. And I think more of the, the transferable currencies. So Amex membership rewards and chase ultimate rewards. I know for certain British airways is a transfer partner of, okay. So if you have chase ultimate rewards or Amex membership rewards, you can send them to British airways. Okay. So still haven't given you any compelling reason to do that, but I'm, I'm painting the picture of, all right, you can use British Airways miles to book flights on their alliance partner. All right. So again, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. I want to fly to Miami. I, if I had British Airways miles, I could do that on that American airlines flight. Now, why would I want to do that? Because the British Airways system is distance based. Okay. And 
I did not do this uh, this search before we're doing it here, but I'll, I'll go to the Great Circle Mapper. So it's gcmap.com. And just in the top search box, it's RIC. I know the, the airport code. So it's RIC-MIA uh, for Miami. And that'll show up as it's 825 miles is the flight distance. Okay, the actual distance of that flight from the geographical airport of Richmond down to Miami, okay? And the cool thing again is that British Airways is a distance-based system. So I'm trying to find like uh, their award chart here, but I think that should be 7,500 miles one way or 15,000 miles round trip. Now don't quote me on that because that's, uh, I'm using that from memory from a couple years ago, but I, I think it, I, I'm fairly certain that's accurate. So that would be for that exact same flight, Jonathan. That exact same flight, just knowing that trick, that British Airways has a distance-based system, I could pay 15,000 miles instead of the standard 25,000 miles. So that is a massive 40% discount off of using the normal 25,000 American miles. So that is the case in point for, it, it paints a picture of these sweet spots of using alliance partners and the inefficiencies or, or things that you, you can exploit in their award charts to fly on other alliance partners. And, you know, again, it's just, how can I win? And it's just understanding the rules. You're not doing anything wrong. That's the British Airways system, right? And as long as you know that, you can potentially take advantage of it. So anyway, long story short, gcmap.com is actually a really fun site to use, Jonathan. It's actually, it's kind of cool to like, any of those neat maps you've seen actually in our travel course. So Ed, Ed created this amazing travel rewards course at chooseofi.com slash travel. And every single map that's in there that you can see like point to point with a little red line in between the airports, no matter how far or close they are, that was all created at, at gcmap.com. So it's actually kind of fun to play around. And I guess the, the concept is like these great circle routes. So it's like the shortest course between two points on, I'm reading this from Google, I'm not this smart, but between two <laughs> points on the surface of a sphere. So it's it's kind of cool to play around and see like, hey, what's the longest flight I could take? And you think, oh, to go from here to Siberia is halfway around the world, but you're just flying over the top. It, it's actually it really, for a geek, it's kind of fun to uh, to play around with that. So the, the actual practical purpose of that website is for these distance based awards, but you can just have fun, frankly. Awesome, okay. Well, let's go ahead and air, uh, play up a voicemail. Cool. Hello, Jonathan and Brad. I have been skeptical of credit cards with annual fees. I don't spend a lot, which usually does not make the annual fee worth it on an ongoing basis. It seems like the main benefit is a sign-up bonus. What do I do after? Do I downgrade it? What are the rules or consequences of doing that? Thank you. Paola from Texas. Awesome question. So Brad, I'm going to defer this one to you. I will just say it's a loyalty program and I am not very loyal. I am very mercenary. Uh, it is, it is a value exchange proposition. And if the, uh, for me, if it depends on how much value ultimately that I am getting, you know, from the card, if the value changes over time, uh, and goes down, then that would affect my decision one way or the other. Con conversely though, I've had cards with annual fees that uh, I have continued to use long after getting the bonus and really have no plan to close. So we can give you maybe some examples, but that would be just my take. Like ultimately this is an exchange of value. And the question comes down to, are you getting value from the card? And it sounds like you're assessing a couple of the details already, Brad, how would you shade that? Yeah. I, so I think this again goes back to, obviously you have to do what you're comfortable with. So nobody's trying to talk you into anything here. Obviously you have to figure out like what works for your life. So can you hit that minimum spending requirement? Obviously without, and Jonathan, we didn't talk about this before, but clearly to hit a minimum spending requirement and like make up or spend extra money, like that doesn't make any sense, right? You're not getting free travel by spending extra money, right? So if you think that you can hit the spending requirement over those X number of months, usually three, then, then you start considering this, right? So in this case, obviously nobody really, I don't love paying annual fees, but I consider what is, what is the value? So in that case of the Chase Sapphire Preferred that we mentioned, and Jonathan, we didn't mention this before, but you can check that out at chooseofi.com slash CSP for Chase Sapphire Preferred. That's our full review of that card. Uh, again, it's our high, most highly recommended card, but 
you have to pay an, a $95 fee with that, right? But if you can get 80,000 ultimate rewards points that you think are probably worth 1600 bucks, I think 99.9% .9 of people are going to take the 1600, net it with the 95 and say, all right, I'm still 1505 to the good. So you're, you're pretty happy with that. You know, that said, there are some cards that have significant annual fees and then it comes down to personal preference, right? Like for me, the Chase Sapphire Reserve, which is a, a different card from the preferred, okay, that has a much higher fee somewhere in it uh, has a $550 annual fee. And while you're still getting massive value out of that card and there's a a travel reimbursement on that that's $300 every anniversary year. So you even net that 550 with the 300 bucks, right? So you're really only paying 250 out of pocket and then there are other benefits, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like plus the big bonus for me personally, I don't love paying a $550 annual fee. So like, that's something that I frankly have never, I know Jonathan, you've opened that card, but I've never opened that card. Uh, I think, if I were, if you set, you know, if I sat myself down and said, all right, is there value there? Obviously there's value, but that's not something that I'm comfortable with. So again, that's the starting point is comfort. But you know, from then on you look at, all right, am I getting value from this card? I think that, you know, a lot of people ask us like, do I close the card? Do I downgrade the card? What do I do? Like that again, that is personal preference, you know? And, and I think you really need to consider like, what kind of value are you getting from the card? There are many cards that like these, uh, these transferable cards, many of them to keep the flexibility of those points of having them sit in your chase account or Amex account. Uh, let's use chase again for that, just to keep it, to keep it clean here. I actually keep my chase Sapphire preferred card open and I pay that $95 annual fee year after year because I have hundreds of thousands of ultimate rewards points. And my only other option would really be to transfer them speculatively, right? I wouldn't know where do I want to spend them. That's the beauty of having these points is you have the flexibility, right? To send them at a moment's notice. So I've made the determination that that flexibility is worth the $95 fee to me. I'm happy to pay that to preserve that flexibility as opposed to saying, hey, I think sometime in the next three years, I'm going to use United Miles and send all my hundreds of thousands of points to United, or, you know, again, come up with some ridiculous scheme. I'll send some to Hyatt. I'll send some to Southwest. I'll send some, you know, like that's ridiculous. You have no idea. So I've made that determination that I pay that fee and I gladly do that. Yeah. And that's, and that's really where my wife and I were as well, being longtime reserve holders. And we were justifying that fee because a lot of that actually, it's kind of an artificial high when you have uh, travel related expenses um, you get a pretty significant, uh, refund on travel related expenses. And at the time it was around $300. And so, uh, we made the decision to, to downgrade those cards to, or exchange those cards to the, to the preferred. So there is, there's room there. And actually that room, actually, uh, you, you can do that in other, in other categories as well. And I think we, actually, there's some lessons around that on what to do, but to your point, Brad, there, that unique feature is really special with the chase Sapphire preferred and the chase products in that, uh, there's no deadline or expiration date on any of your points when they're being held and chase ultimate rewards. Um, and you know, if you go and you speculatively dump them all into something like United or, or maybe another one, maybe Marriott, et cetera, there are sometimes conditions and how long, you know, these points are good for if you don't use them. And there's workarounds for that, but it does add complexity. So if you have kind of a long-term travel strategy, then it's really nice to be able to have a home base for those that, you know, uh, you just don't need to worry about it. You've got all the flexibility and no fine print that they're going to expire on you. Um, and let me, there was one other aspect to the question that she asked that was kind of interesting. Like, you know, can I afford that minimum spend? Cause signing up for a card that has a $4,000 minimum spend can feel, uh, a little bit intimidating. I would imagine like, I don't, I, you know, and I think it's probably worth pointing out one, you know, don't spend, we're not encouraging you to spend more than you have or than you would normally, but it is probably looking through this and, and seeing like you have three months that's around, you know, $1,200, $1,300 a month of spending that you could put on the card. What are your options for that? And so first and foremost, the easy stuff like groceries, some utilities actually will work, you know, just your normal spending. How far does that actually get you? And maybe for some individuals, I would imagine that, six or $700 a month is 
pretty doable. It's in range for many people to have uh, expenses that are approaching that. So you're really only talking about potentially a, a gap of, you know, 200, 300, $500 that you're, that you might be worried about. And this is where you could start to get creative around, is there a way that I could front load some of my expenses? Like for instance, could you pay your insurance policy for a whole year up front? Or, uh, is there some purchases that I know that I'm going to have in a couple months that I could accelerate to go ahead and help me meet the spend? This is still normal spending. You're just recognizing that it would be beneficial to you to the tune of nearly a thousand to $1,500 to make those payments sooner than later. And there's far more creative ways than what I just said, but I just kind of wanted to get the, the juices flowing in terms of how to mentally think about a $4,000 minimum spend as opposed to, Hey, let's go. I don't know. Buy whatever X, Y, Z. <laughs> awesome thing. iPhone 12 gold edition. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a good way to put that. And actually, uh, the beauty of these live uh, live events here, we have Susie calling in with some feedback uh, for the last the last caller. So let me cue that up. Hi guys, this is Susie again from Richmond. I just wanted to make a point about the person from Texas who had asked the question about getting your money's worth on the annual fee. One of the ways to do it is to do a retention call where you tell the credit card company that you're thinking about canceling the card and the credit card company like American Express or Chase will tell you about the benefits that you can get your money's worth from the annual fee. And then uh, usually I'll say, well, I'm not sure I can even still get my money's worth because I might not use those benefits. And then a lot of times if you ask if there's a retention offer, they'll be able to tell you, well, we can offer you this if you keep your card open for at least a year. So most recently I did some retention calls with American Express uh, and my husband did it through chat and both he and I were able to get 15,000 sky miles for our Delta Platinum American Express card. Nice, I oh, let go of the like button. We but we got the idea. No, right? she might've ran out with the minute, but that's a, <laughs> either which that's a great, great voicemail, Susan. And yeah, that, that ties into like my concept of, are you getting value from the card? Right? So many cards or some cards have, uh, offers where on your, on your anniversary, you get X, like you might get a free night in a hotel, or you might get a certain number of airline miles. I know Southwest, uh, Southwest does, or, or used to do that. So, uh, there are certainly many situations where, where it may be worth it. And Susie's idea is a brilliant one about, about retention. So it never hurts to make that call. It's, uh, it's like, we've, we've always talked about here at Choose Avaya. Everything is negotiable. You just have to ask the question. So, Hey, I'm thinking about, I'm not sure if, if this card makes sense for me anymore, if I'm getting value from it. And you might see what, what they can offer you. So, I mean, there's literally no harm in doing that. So yeah, thank you, Susie. And actually we have a, another voice. I was going to say, Susie kind of teed us up for it. Cause she mentioned doing this with her husband. What does this look like in two yep. player mode, right? It's yeah, Perfect. Let's, let's cue it up here. Hello. My husband and I are new to travel rewards and are really interested in the whole process. Uh, in my research, I've heard about two-player mode, and I'm wondering what the most efficient way for us to gain the cards uh, while being efficient with our spending limits on each of those cards would be. Thank you so much. So there is a lot of opportunity here, Brad. I mean, I think what this presents us is the opportunity to really talk about spacing and why spacing could be a very effective long-term strategy to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe you can, you can dive into that. I, I was going to mention just like the real high level of, of who can open up cards, right? So I think it's really important to distinguish between, Hey, my husband opened up a card you know, the first question is usually, can I get that card also? Hey, we're married, you know, as a married couple, we, my husband applied for this card. We have it. Are we stuck? Is that it? And the, the really nice answer to this is that no, you are not stuck. You each, each individual person, each adult can open up a card in their name and social security number. Okay. So that is just a critical piece of information when it comes to travel rewards. So for instance, my wife, Laura, 
has a Chase Sapphire Preferred. I have a Chase Sapphire Preferred. We've opened up, you know, many, many cards over the last almost 10 years at this point. And yeah, we can each get these cards. So really for for those in a in a relationship, you do essentially double the available universe of cards, which is nice. I guess the then the next follow up question and, and Jonathan, it's funny, like there's always nuance. There's always nuance to this. But but the high level is that even if you added so let's say Laura opened up a Sapphire Preferred in her name and social and added me as an authorized user. OK, and I got a credit card on her account. That still doesn't mean I can't open up the same card in my name and social and and get the bonus again. Now, like I said, this there's always nuance. So that used I was to not be, expecting you to say that. I did not actually realize that that was a hole for me. Yeah, now there's I, I am curious if there's a downside to doing that, because I always associated the authorized user application with um with maybe some limits that we'll talk about shortly. But uh, I did not realize that you could both be an authorized user on a card and apply for said same card in your own name. Yep. Yep. So that's, you know, just important knowledge. You know, if hitting that minimum spend, if you just could not possibly get there without both of you spending on an account, that's something you need to consider. And that that used to years ago, that was perfectly fine. There was no downside to that. Now, and this this is going to be outside of the scope of of this exercise here on the podcast, but this is in the travel course at chooseavai.com slash travel. And certainly on the internet, you can find if you search Chase 524, okay? Chase, as we've talked about many times, they have a fantastic array of travel rewards cards, certainly not just limited to the ultimate rewards cards, but they have many of the co-branded, the United cards, the Southwest cards, you know, the, the Hyatt card, et cetera, many of the Marriott cards, there's lots of different chase cards. So you ideally don't want to get shut out of, of being able to get approved for chase credit cards. Now, the nuance here is that this 524 is that you can pretty much only get approved for five cards in the prior 24 month period. Okay. And now authorized user cards do count against you. So if your spouse opened up a card and opened up a card in their name and social and added you as an authorized user, that one authorized user actually counts towards your 520, 524. Okay. So that I would say, unless you absolutely dire need to have both of you spending on an account to hit that minimum spend, do not add authorized users. It's just right now, it's not, not the preferred strategy here for sure. So here's how, um, I, I kind of visualize this and I'd be curious, Brad, if you would, if, you know, with the benefit now of hindsight, you would kind of do something similar, but I basically for my wife and I playing two player mode here, one of us, it would, is more focused on chase and the other one is focused on chase to start with, but then we just keep going. And so the strategy basically looks like you always start with Chase because Chase is the most restrictive or nearly always start with Chase in terms of this 524. But one of you always keeps that 524 in mind and there's some spacing involved and the other party is free to no longer worry about 524. And so that is kind of like how my wife and I kind of take a look at that. We will probably both start at Chase and then one of us just kind of always keeps their limitations in mind uh, in terms of our pacing. And we're not super aggressive with this. So, so we're not, we're, we're keeping a cadence going, but we're not always trying to be right up on the line. So the person that is the non-aggressive person that usually is the person that's still staying in the Chase ecosystem, that individual is just being cognizant of whether or not they're falling inside or outside of those Chase 524 limits. The other person doesn't have that restraint, right? That's just kind of my mind in two player mode. That's what makes sense but I'd be curious if there's any more nuance that you would add on to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you hit that pretty well. I think, you know, it comes down to, to your family and your situation, how much spending, how comfortable you are, et cetera, et cetera. My wife and I, you know, when we were doing this uh, more significantly, certainly, you know, before 2020, we were, we still weren't going crazy. You know, we're just, we're opening one card at a time, spending on that for a number of months. And then we moved on to the next card there, you know, there certainly in the, the good old days of travel rewards, people would, would do this much, much, much more aggressively. It's a lot harder to do that now with, with 524. So I think just a measured approach makes sense. But, it, but again, just having the knowledge of 
each adult can open up a card in their name and social that that in and of itself is if there's just one takeaway from this like that that is the critical critical well, piece i would say the second takeaway is definitely the household key to this like when you're in one household and we're talking about ultimate rewards and maybe this extends to some of the other programs but certainly ultimate rewards you are able to transfer those ultimate rewards uh, between people in the same household. This is massive. Hard to overstate this. And so just, just keep that in mind. Those are not siloed out. You know, they are our family's points and uh, you can use those as you will. Let me ask you this, Brad, your, your favorite, do you have a favorite uh, kind of default card that is a non-annual fee card. You know, I was just thinking about uh, the question that we got earlier there. You know, the premium cards all have significant perks that come along with the ownership. I mean, that's that's the value proposition. Do you have a a card that is your preferred credit card that does not have an annual fee? That does not have an annual fee. Uh, that is a good question. So so we talk about storing. So we're talking about storing here, like our, uh, chase ultimate rewards points. I know I have this might, I don't know if I'm going to give information here. That's not helpful anymore, but I have uh, an American express card that has no annual fee that allows me to store my Amex membership rewards points. I think it's the Amex every day. And I'll have to look up if uh, that's the thing with these, these credit cards, the products do change occasionally. So like, you know, there's, some, there was, I think the Amex everyday preferred at one point and the regular everyday and, and all this stuff. So, uh, hold on, give me a second. Let me make sure this still exists. But, um, basically, yeah, this card allowed me to store my Amex membership rewards points in a card that had no annual fee, which was nice. So I was able to get all of my membership rewards points from, let's say Amex gold or Amex platinum and get them over to this everyday card. So I still have that card open and I, you know, just have my store of Amex membership rewards points. So yeah, that's, that's the card that jumps out to me. Um, Ed will chime in here if there's any additional nuance that I need to know. He's, he's really an expert when it comes to the, the Amex system, but yeah, that's the card that jumps out to me. I was going to add, there is one more little caveat and it's pretty well known in the military community, but just, just worth mentioning in the context of this call that active duty military do get, uh, a, really a, an amazing, uh, deal when it comes to, uh, annual fees on at least two of the major premium cards, Brad, I believe. And I was going to go, I think, I think it's the, the chase line of products. Uh, so the reserve or preferred, and then also the Amex, their premium Amex card. Do they waive the fee for active duty military? Is that still an accurate statement? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great call, Jonathan. So we have a, a huge uh, section of the choose of I community, the whole five community is, is military. And one of the really neat things and it, 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 how this always was kind of billed was the Amex Platinum. That's kind of the, the card that, that people really look to. But yeah, if you, so American Express and you're right, Chase, Chase does this as well for active duty military, they waive the annual fees on these cards. So if you're talking an Amex Platinum card, that has a fee somewhere in the vicinity of, of $500. You have a Chase Sapphire Reserve, which has, a, as we talked about before, $550 annual fee. You can, you can get those fees waived. And uh, we have an article, Jonathan, I don't think we have a short link, but we'll put it in the show notes to this episode. Uh, we have an article talking about this in depth on chooseify.com. So, yeah, I mean, this is something there are just specific things to call up and ask for, et cetera. But I know many members of, of you know, many friends of mine personally have done this. And, yeah, it's pretty cool to get all those bonuses that come with those ultra, ultra premium cards and get it for for no annual fee. So, yeah, that's uh, that's a really good call. We should just say that when we're starting to talk about Amex, this is a deep rabbit hole of travel rewards and uh if you love complexity and options, the Amex Platinum might provide that to you. And if you want to deep dive in that, Ed has uh, dedicated extensive resources to showing you all the ways to squeeze every little bit of value out of the Amex cards. And uh, highly encourage you to check out that content, especially if for you Amex uh, Platinum holders. All right, Jonathan, we got another question here. So let's, uh, let's cue it up. 
Hi guys, my main question is as follows. I recently opened up the Freedom Unlimited card by Chase. Now I'm thinking of uh, transferring all my points from the Chase Sapphire Preferred over to the Freedom Unlimited. Uh, if I cancel the Sapphire Preferred so I don't have to pay the annual fee, will I still have access to the travel portal to be able to to get flights and book you know, hotels and stuff like that? Or will I lose that privilege? Okay, so this is a good question. So uh, the Chase cards, so there are the the premium Chase cards, right? There's the Chase Sapphire Preferred, the Chase Sapphire Reserve, and there's the Chase Inc. Business Preferred, okay? Those three cards, if you have, so ultimate rewards is the currency. So you have the ultimate rewards points. And if you have any of those three cards, then you can transfer the points to their travel partners, okay? So that is where the real significant value is. So like we've talked about, there are a bunch of different uh, redemption options for ultimate rewards. You can just trade them in for cash at one cent per point. You can use the travel portal. And depending on the card, you usually get 1.25 cents per point. Uh, on Sapphire Preferred and Inc. Business Preferred, you get 1.5 cents per point on Chase Sapphire Reserve. So that can be real nice. Or really the best way, like we've talked about many times and certainly earlier in this episode, is transferring them to the travel partner. So that's what you're really looking for. You need to have one of those cards open to be able to do that. So in this case, he had the one of the Freedom cards and he had the Chase Sapphire Preferred. Okay. So, right, if you wanted to keep the redemption possibility of all of those points, you could actually transfer your freedom points. You could do the opposite. If you didn't close, you could combine your freedom points into your premium card, your Sapphire card, and you could then transfer all of those points. So it actually makes all of the freedom points much more valuable that way, which is really, really cool. But now, unfortunately, it doesn't work the other way. So if you took your Sapphire preferred points and combine them into your freedom card and then close the Sapphire Preferred, then you no longer have a premium card open and you cannot transfer to the travel partners. So that reduces your redemption options significantly there. So I think that's something that you really need to consider. So, you know, if you at some point in the future wanted to then reopen one of the premium cards, one of the aforementioned three premium cards, you know, down the road a couple of years from now, you could do that and then combine, take all those points you had sitting in freedom and combine back into this newly open card. But, you know, Jonathan, that's, that's a risk, obviously, right? Like that's a risk that you might not get approved for that card sometime down the road. There are rules as to only being able to open up, or at least at the time of, of that we're recording this, only be able to open up one Sapphire product every 48 months. So, you know, you're taking a risk by doing that. Certainly if, you know, that might be a case I talked about before, like I'm willing to pay the $95 annual fee because I didn't want to speculatively just transfer points to United or Southwest or whomever. That might be a case where you say like, Hey, this, this I'm giving up so much value that I might want to speculatively transfer them. So I think that, you know, that's kind of the thought process that I would look at when it comes to these type of cards. And now again, I said when it came to at least, you know, in my case with that Amex every day, and this is talking about American Express now, they don't have that limit. So my Amex membership rewards points that sit in my everyday card are still transferable, which is pretty cool. So, you know, again, this is this is the the nuance of of just, you know, there's so many little details, but you know, Jonathan Ed, that's why that's why we have Ed. <laughs> <I'll choose a laughs> and, <laughs> and we'll and we'll we'll tell everybody one more time how they can get how they can get access to like Ed's mind as well. But I just like to put a little wrapper around this. We've kind of given you hopefully a general idea of the what and the why and a little bit of the how. But then now let's just say you want to flex your new travel muscles. You know, maybe you're gonna go take this just kind of free tutorial, this free course that we've put together to to brush up on some of the details, but generally just let me put all this together for you in kind of a wrapper. You want to go somewhere in the world. Let's start by, let's determine what airlines serve the airports that are around you, right? So you already know your, your nearest major airport, but go ahead and figure out what are the other major airports that are nearby, you know, just in case 
you need to go to these airports for an almost free ticket. Flexibility is our guiding light. Now, how do we then stack the tools? We're going to use Google flights. We're going to find out which airlines fly from your airport to various destinations. Keep in mind, we just want to see the world. We're tired of being in our house. Let's go see the world. So you have these various destinations in mind. You don't necessarily have just one place. You have various destinations in mind and you really want to get a sense or a feel for what would this cost if you were paying cash and how many stopovers there might be, if any. Now, this may not be the exact way. You may have the one trip and it works for the one trip too. But just in terms of the Marla approach to this, where could we go? Where could we, like, it's a big world. We get one life. We want to go see a bit of it. Uh, that's just kind of the mentality if you want to apply some creativity to this and flex the, your time freedom that you've obtained. So we're going to find out a little bit of be detail about the airlines that serve our airports. We're going to find out a little bit about the alliance networks that are in the, that are covered. That's going to give us information. This is going to be really useful as Brad was mentioning earlier, because now we know how these alliance partners work and we know how these transfer partners work. We want to give ourselves as much flexibility. So for example, you know, uh, using Singapore airlines, the Chris flyer miles to redeem for a flight from Los Angeles to Honolulu on United airlines. That's right. Hawaii. You want to go to Hawaii? Let's figure that out. Once you've got all of that together, you've had fun with your maps, you've had the fun with your visualization, you're using some of that creativity. People were locked in our homes anyways all the time. What are you doing with this? Turn off Netflix, figure out how we're going to go see the world. Now, we've also talked about the six main ways to build a stash of miles for your awards points. And, and we work through those again. Make sure, you know, if those don't immediately come to mind because of this conversation, you go back to the free course that we mentioned and you aggregate those. But there's a bunch of different ways that you can aggregate these points. And you know now about the tools that are at your disposal to bring it all together. And then hopefully we've talked finally about a few of those points that might make you afraid to get started. You know, you're going to be okay. Like get, do it. It's worth it. There's real money here. There's opportunity cost for not doing this. Uh, keep in mind when you just decide to go pay for the trip, your normal approach, you're paying for it with after tax dollars. So whatever that $2,000 sticker price was, add on another 20 or 30% that you had to earn to in order to feel to justify it. There's a massive opportunity cost for not thinking about travel through this lens and then just say, okay, what do we want to do next? And all we're trying to do with this is just demystify it because it is kind of a little bit scary at first, but it doesn't have to be. And so my encouragement to you would be whether or not you want to go to Europe, whether or not you are, you're in Europe, whether or not you want to go to Europe, whether or not you want to go to Alaska, whether or not you want to go to Hawaii, maybe you want to travel domestic, uh, maybe you want to go to Disney World, you know, whatever that might be, just look at that through the lens of how travel worlds might be able to get you there without you needing to set aside money inside your actual budget for that. And then just start having fun with this. Be creative. And Brad, I will just give this back to you if you want to add any additional final thought on that and also tell people how they can brush up on the finer details that I just mentioned. Yeah, I think you covered it. And and I think uh, I think this was another just good overview of just the why of this, right? And with a lot of real specific detail peppered in. So a huge thanks to everybody for, for all the questions. A huge thanks to Ed for moderating this and for, as you said, creating the travel course at Chooseify. So yeah, I think for anybody looking to get started, chooseify.com slash travel is certainly the, the great way, the easy way to get into this concept in real depth. And also we, uh, you can get access to our Chooseify travel Facebook group there as well. Uh, I think, like we said many times, there are lots of lots of credit card options to get these massive bonuses. You know, right now, as we're recording this, uh, if you go to chooseavi.com slash CSP, it is the best all time bonus on that card. So uh, this is a really, really attractive time to consider consider opening that. So you can find our full review there. And yeah, I mean, just just like anything, it's do your research, but get started. Take action. Right. Get up off the couch and take action. It's always better to have these points in advance of when you need them. And then when you find those redemptions, you can just book them. And I mean, Jonathan, you know, this is real. I know this is real. We've done this for years. And I mean, my family has saved tens of thousands of dollars using rewards points. It's, it's astonishing. And if you're going to stay on the couch, at least open up the laptop and pull up Google flights, start visualizing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the great circle mapper. It's awesome. There you go. All right, my friends, that's it. The fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.